I thank you for the welcome. Glad to be here. We are here, I think, because we intend to practice the precept to remember those who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow. And from time to time it is good that we should pause and look back and think of eminent leaders of the church who God blessed in their own generation and whose work and testimony goes on, they being dead yet speaking. Dr. Lloyd-Jones has left us legacies and uh, our subject is the consideration of some of these great legacies that have come to us. We all know what a legacy is, something of value, maybe material, maybe monetary, something that is handed on from one generation to another. Usually the persons to benefit from a legacy are named, carefully named in documents, but in the case of ministers of the gospel, these legacies are for the people of God down through the ages and they live on. And so it is true tonight that I believe we can speak of the legacies of Dr. Lloyd-Jones as legacies that we inherit, in which we have an interest, in which we trust generation that may yet come will have an interest. Briefly, let me try to summarize his life. Some of you will be familiar, I'm sure, with the facts and others perhaps not. He was born on the 20th of December in 1899, the last year of that century, 19th century, December the 20th, in Cardiff, South Wales. He was one of a family of three brothers. His father was a small shopkeeper, general store, grocery goods, uh, farm goods. They lived in South Wales until the first year of the, the outbreak of the World, First World War, 1914. His father's business had run into much difficulty. He decided to move to London. He was able to obtain a small dairy in Westminster in central London. And so the whole family moved up, three brothers, mother, and uh, Lloyd-Jones, when he was a boy of 14, 15, would often have to go out on a milk run before he went to school in the morning. He went to Marylebone Grammar School. He did brilliantly. And at the age of 16, he had access to any of the great teaching hospitals in London. He had intended uh, by this time to be a medical doctor. So he went to St. Bartholomew's Hospital. Graduated at the age of 21 and graduated with such distinction that he had, his work had caught the attention of Sir Thomas Horder, who was one of the professors at Bart's and also a physician to the king. And Horder asked this young Welshman to come and be an assistant to him. So, at that early age of 21, Martin Lloyd-Jones became an assistant to Horder, later Lord Horder, worked with him on Harley Street, um, had access through him to some of the great and mighty in the land because Horder's patients from the king downwards to prime ministers and members of parliament. Uh, this was the sphere in which Lloyd-Jones began his work. Sir Patterson Ross, who was the president of the Royal College of Sur Surgeons, was later to say that Lloyd-Jones was one of the best clinicians that he ever knew. So his medical career had a wonderful beginning and then it suddenly came to a stop in the year 1926. That year he announced that he was retiring from medicine and he was going to a mission hall in Aberavon, South Wales, to preach the gospel. And that's what he did, January 1927. He married Beth and Phillips and began a preaching ministry in South Wales. 1927 to 1938. 1938, his physical condition demanded a rest and a real break, so he retired from the work in Aberavon at Port Talbot, uh, Campbell Morgan, who was at Westminster Chapel at that time, elderly man, 
uh, asked him to come and assist him for a little, maybe three months or so, and Lloyd-Jones, after some hesitation, because his main love was in Wales, after some hesitation, he consented to come, and instead of waiting for three months, he stayed there for the next 30 years. He was Minister of Westminster Chapel from 1938, assistant first colleague, and then from 1943, the minister through to 1968 and his retirement. 1968, he had serious surgery, but he recovered well, and he went on preaching to, into his 80th year, and he died on the 1st of March, 1981. I should say he was very often in Scotland for the first time in 1938 and then again uh, 1941, March 1941 in the Free Church College in, in Edinburgh uh, giving lectures on Romans in the Presbytery Hall. It's rather a miscalculation on the part of the organisers because the Presbytery Hall was so crowded and the surrounding corridors that the people couldn't really be got in. That was his first speaking at the Free Church College and thereafter 1942 St Andrew's Hall in Glasgow he was very often in Scotland I remember one memorable occasion in 1960 when he spoke to an interdenominational gathering of ministers in Dingwall and preached in the Dingwall Church and right through to the end in May 1980 when he really shouldn't have been travelling at all he was very seriously ill he preached for the last time in Glasgow Psalm 2, kiss the son, lest he be angry. That was the last month he preached in public and uh, his love for Scotland was abiding. He was here almost every year and I'm sure that many of you heard him preach. So that is his life in brief. Last year of the 19th century to the year 1981. The first legacy that I suggest to you he leaves for us is the example of what a Christian minister and pastor ought to be. Now in saying that I need to remind you what a change took place in the Christian ministry between the year 1900 and the year 2000. In the year 1900 the Christian minister had a position of some considerable influence and strength in the community, in all parts of Britain. His word carried some weight, his congregations were usually well attended, and he was a figure generally esteemed. Go on a hundred years from that date to our recent century, and what a change we see. Christian ministry has become something in many quarters viewed as simply insignificant sometimes an object of mirth on the television or on radio programs, the influence, the weight of the ministry of the gospel is nothing as it was in an earlier day. Now, why did that happen? Why did it happen? And I suggest to you it happened for the very same reason as we find it happening in the scriptures, that is in the Old Testament. You know, there were times in history, as there have been since, uh, when the work that God calls men to becomes discredited. And it's discredited because God has said, them that honour me, I will honour. And those that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. And there were times in the Old Testament when the priesthood turned from the word of God and God made them contemptible in the eyes of the people. We read that in Malachi, in other passages of the word of God. And that happened in Britain. The ministry became a profession. Men went to university, they went to theological college, they went out into churches, and tragically, very often, instead of purely preaching the word of God, they began to preach merely the ideas of men. And as they did that, the whole standing of the ministry fell. And it fell, I believe, by the hand of God. God humbled the Christian ministry. 
Now, when that happens, and as I say, it's happened on many occasions in history, God has his own way of restoring the true work of the gospel minister. Did it in the Old Testament, calls Amos from being a farmer to being a prophet. He did it gloriously at the time of the Reformation. John Knox was a church lawyer before he was a preacher. God calls men and endures them afresh. And Lord Jones was called, and called from the most unlikely place. He was called from a citadel of humanism, scientific rationalism, St. Bartholomew's Hospital, leading teaching hospital in London, was the pride of scientific achievement, evolutionary belief. It was the temple of all that science stood for. And science, by that date, as so many believed, had discredited the infallibility of the word of God. Science had made it impossible any longer for us to treat the Bible as verbally inspired. And from that context, God called this man to be a minister of the gospel. And he called him in such a way that there really was no explanation for why this man should go into the ministry, no explanation in any worldly terms. From a high salary on Harley Street, he came down to £225 a year. To a small house in a working class industrial area of South Wales. The explanation was that God had called him to this. And it wasn't an easy call. He was engaged at the time and his future wife was not at all certain that it was the right thing to do. Other people advised him to remain in medicine and then do some preaching part-time. But no, he was convinced this is what God had called him to do. When he spoke at the Free Church College, as I mentioned, in 1941, Principal McLean, introducing him, began by paying compliment to the man's sacrifice and uh, the step he had taken in leaving medicine to become a preacher. Dr. Lloyd-Jones was really quite indignant and he said by way of reply, I gave up nothing. I received everything. I count it the highest honour God can confer on any man to call him to be a herald of the gospel. So, here was a man in the ministry with authority, with certainty, with a life that was in harmony with what he said. A humble man, a man who had given up desire for earthly applause. And people who heard him, people who met him, found in him an example of what, as I say, a Christian minister ought to be. And that example touched many lives and still does. And I think it will come down into the future as men read of his life and his example, it commends to us what a Christian minister ought to be. When Lloyd-Jones retired in 1968, the Christian Medical Fellowship, to which he still belonged, uh, paid tribute to him and this is what they said, we would like first to refer to your personal example, which has emphasized in so unique a manner the importance and the dignity of the Christian ministry. So that's a first legacy. Now a second one. And this is more important. Dr. Mary Jones, I believe, has given to us and exemplified in his ministry that true Christianity is God centered religion. That is to say, it begins with God. It's about God Almighty, God the Creator, God the Sovereign Ruler of all men, God who has inspired the Holy Scriptures, God who has so loved the world that he gave his Son, God who will bring all things to an end and to his own glory, of him and through him and to him, are all things. Now, one has to look back and remember that in speaking like that, a very different ethos prevailed when Lloyd-Jones 
began his ministry. In Wales, the typical pulpit ethos was sentimental, anecdotal, not distinctly modernistic or liberal, perhaps, but non-doctrinal, certainly, as I say, sentimental. And then many pulpits, sadly, were liberal. And that meant that their whole focus was on uh, preaching that would bring comfort, preaching that would give satisfaction, preaching orientated to people's needs. Man is the centre of all things. And then there were evangelical pulpits. But you know, many evangelical pulpits began with the cross and they spoke of the need of forgiveness and conversion. And that's all very good. But God raised up this man to say that the gospel doesn't begin with the cross. It begins with the God who's created all things, to whom all men must give an account. It's only as men are brought into the presence of God that they can become conscious of the need of what Christ did when he died on Calvary. Gospel preaching begins with God. How can we define sin apart from God? Sin is rebellion against God. Calvary is propitiation. God's holy, righteous judgment upon sin. Born by his own Son. It speaks to us of God. Conversion is turning from self to God. How is conversion possible? With man it is impossible, but not with God. Lord Jones began preaching in a way that seemed utterly remarkable to many people that heard it. Utterly old-fashioned. He was simply using the word of God. And his belief was that true Christianity is God-centered religion. And we should be God-conscious people. And preachers should be men with a sense of God about them. Now I say that was something very different in many cases. And so the question arises, and I put it in here, how did Lloyd-Jones come to that view of things? How did he learn it? Was there some particular book that helped him? And the answer to these questions is no. Uh, the explanation is this. It was that God himself had intervened in Lloyd-Jones's life. You see, he'd become a church member when he was 14 years old, a communicant, as so many did, without any real personal knowledge of God. He had been a churchgoer all his days when he went to London, medicine, still attending Welsh Calvinistic Methodist Church. But then when he got into medicine, actually before he got into medicine, first of all in 1918, his brother, elder brother, died in the great flu epidemic. And then his father died, who he much loved, in 1921. And suddenly the idea of the brevity of life began to dawn upon him. But then, as I was going to say, when he got into medicine, rubbing shoulders with the great and the mighty, and mixing with top medical men, men who could diagnose almost any disease, who had treatments for all sorts of ailments, he discovered that these great men couldn't deal with their own hearts. They had no remedy for pride or selfishness or vanity or impurity sometimes. And as this discovery came to him, God simultaneously showed him it was true in his own life, in his own heart, that he was indeed a sinner. And about the age of 24, he came to an end of himself. And I say, God intervened in his life. He belonged, as I mentioned, to the Welsh Calvinistic Methodist Church. And now, for the first time, he really understood what the word Calvinistic meant. It means, of course, that without God's intervention and help, we are all utterly lost and ruined. The truths that we call Calvinism 
are truths that tell us that all our salvation comes because God in his great pity and compassion has looked upon sinners, determined our salvation, sought us when we didn't seek him, done for us what we could never do for ourselves, made us new creatures in Christ Jesus. It's not that our comfort is not that we love God, but that he loves us, that he has set his heart upon us, and that we belong to him because of that grace and that grace alone. Now, Lord Jones wasn't a great user of the word Calvinism or Calvinistic. He didn't care for the word particularly. He used it sometimes, but the important thing was what the truths mean that those words represent. And to him, those truths were of great importance. And one reason they were of great importance, let me just mention two reasons, but the first is this. When a person understands that God is truly at the head of things, ruling, reigning, then it changes the whole approach of the church and the pulpit to preaching. You see, the popular viewpoint was that the great purpose of preaching was to get people to respond, to make them happy or to make them respond to the gospel and that being the great motive, the important thing was not to say anything or do anything that would offend them, that would destroy the purpose of preaching. But that's not the biblical view of preaching. The biblical view of preaching is an announcement about God, about his greatness and majesty and glory and how we've offended him by our sins, and how without his mercy and grace we're altogether undone. The Bible calls us unrighteous, non-righteous, no, not one. We are fools. We are ignorant people. We are in desperate need of his grace. And the Bible talks like that because it knows that our response doesn't depend on winning our sympathy. We don't need to be afraid of offending people. The truth may offend, but God is the one who can break and melt the hardest heart. Our business is to present the truth in its purity and leave to God the consequences. And so, well, we see that, don't we, in our Lord's ministry. You remember how the disciples were alarmed on one occasion when they said to Jesus, Master, don't you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard that saying? Shouldn't you be a little bit more careful? What? Oh, our Lord knew perfectly well. Let them alone, he said. They'd be blind leaders of the blind. A real grasp on the sovereign grace of God makes men bold because they know their business is to stand in the presence of God and to honour him. And it raises up men like John Knox and Robert Bruce and Lloyd Jones and others. You know the words of Horatius Bonner, men heed thee, love thee, praise thee not. The master praises, what are men? That's the viewpoint that comes from a real grasp of the grace of God and our dependence on that grace. So I say, this was of vital importance to Lloyd-Jones. Some people, I need hardly tell you, didn't like him on that account. Some people said, fat Calvinist. But he was simply trying to be faithful to the word of God. But there's a personal reason, a second reason, why these truths were so important to him. He said, there is no doctrine which is so comforting as this. And what he meant by that was, to know as a Christian, it doesn't depend upon me. It didn't begin with me. It won't end with me. It's all the grace of God upon which I stand. In 1942, when bombing was still severe in Glasgow and other places, he had to preach in the St. Andrew's Hall in Glasgow. He had a long train journey. He arrived in Glasgow with a migraine headache. He had not had a meal. There was no time for a meal. There were no taxis to take him from the station to the hall, if I remember correctly. And I nearly said worse than all that. Before he could speak, there were three other speakers, and they were all professors, two professors of medicine and one professor of divinity. And it was nine o'clock before Lloyd-Jones, with a headache, could stand up on his feet and speak as he was intended to do. 
he felt not only weak but I think discouraged and he said as he got to his feet suddenly the words of 1 Corinthians 15 verse 9 came into his mind by the grace of God I am what I am in other words it doesn't depend on me it's not what I am I'm here by the grace of God I'll speak depending on his grace and God gave him that night wonderful help a few months before he was dying when I had the privilege of talking with him he told me he'd been reading two biographies one was of G.M. Trevelyan and another was of J.D. Burnell who was a Cambridge physicist neither of these men were Christians and he explained to me why he had been reading them and it turned out he said to be a tremendous blessing to me because it came to me that these were natural men, human nature at their best why did God ever choose to look upon me? in other words yes let me add it came to me with such force why was God pleased to look upon me in contrast with these men and the despair in which they died he was dying as a Christian Lloyd-Jones by the grace of God so these truths were not just doctrines that he preached but he did live on them cherish them they were precious to him so I say secondly Lloyd-Jones has handed on the truth that real Christianity is God-centered religion. Now a third legacy. It's the truth that the local church is the primary means of evangelism. The primary means of evangelism is the local church. Now that may seem obvious to many people but you know in the last century, the 20th century, it wasn't obvious to the majority most people thought the only way we can make an impression upon our world and society is by massing numbers together interdenominational societies crusades, campaigns get as many churches as you can to act together and the numbers will impress people and thereby we may hope to evangelize now Lloyd-Jones wasn't against cooperation as such but he believed with all his heart that it's the local church that's the primary means of evangelism and he believed that for this reason the message has to be preached there has to be an evangelist, that's true but when the message is preached in a company of believing, worshipping, praying people there is a presence of God and that is the place where so often the outsider, the visitor, the stranger, the careless are arrested and awakened. The Apostle Paul, you remember, speaks about one who coming in will fall down and confess that God is in you, the truth. In other words, it's not just the man in the pulpit, but the believing community of Christians gathered in worship there's something present the Holy Spirit himself and his grace not simply in the preacher but in the people too Lloyd-Jones believed that with all his heart when he first went to Aberavon the church secretary I think at that time was not yet a real Christian but he was very enthusiastic and he had a big poster put up outside the church come and see and hear Martin Lloyd-Jones uh, late at Harley Street this and that and this is the man, oh, said Lord Jones, take it down, never do that again. And the church secretary, E.T. Reese, said, well, he thought this was very odd. And isn't this the right way to get people into interest? Don't do it, said Lord Jones. Why not? Well, why not? Because he believed the real authentication of the gospel is seen in the transformed lives of men and women. The church is the witness, the light set upon a hill it's not a man, it's not an individual, it's not a personality more than that, it's a community of believing people he believed that and he practiced that so the church is a vibrant fellowship of believers you may say, in a real sense, a missionary society 
Now someone might say, well, that's all very well, but our church isn't like that. And what would Lord Jones say to that church? Well, he would say to the pastor, don't scold the people. If the church isn't raised up, your business in the pulpit is to do, by the grace of God, that work that will enliven and quicken and encourage and comfort so that Christians are bright and Christians are happy. You know it was said by a Presbyterian long ago that if Christians were as happy as they're warranted to be, warranted to be, the progress of the gospel would be irresistible. That's the sort of thing Lloyd-Jones believed. That's what the pulpit's for. Not to scold people, not to depress people, certainly not, but so to help the people of God that they will, in this world, be living lights. B.M. Palmer said something that Lloyd-Jones would have agreed with 100%. B.M. Palmer said, I have reached the conviction that the best way to reach the unregenerate is to show him what Christianity is able to do for believers. Well, if there was time and there isn't, I could give you examples from church in South Wales of how that worked out. People like Staffordshire Bill, an old drunkard, and another woman who was a spiritist medium, and many others of whom Mrs. Lloyd-Jones and others have written. And as they came into the community of the church, the church as a living community was the means that led them to Christ. A fourth legacy. The legacy of his preaching. Now, this is a big subject and I, must, uh, I mustn't take too long, but a little about his preaching when he was alive and then a little about his preaching since his death. He went to Wales, as I've reminded you, in 1927, the eve of the Great Depression. And South Wales, nowhere in Britain suffered more than South Wales in terms of poverty, unemployment, children going to school without any breakfast, sometimes without any shoes. It was a, a bad time, difficult time. And uh, a lawyer in Liverpool once said, that two men kept South Wales from communism in the 1930s. One of them was an Aaron Bevan, the socialist MP. The other one was Lloyd Jones, the preacher at Aberavon. In other words, in the midst of a situation of great need, the preaching of the word of God touched lives and changed lives, uplifted lives, touched not simply an individual, but in some cases touched communities. Lloyd Jones believed that preaching is able to do that. Another example of the same thing in 1967. He was asked to preach in Aberfan, South Wales, a valley town, mining town, November 1967. What made the occasion so special was that 12 months before, the end of October 1966, that great disaster had taken place in Aberfan. Um, slurry of coal dust, mountain of coal dust, it's been raining for several days. This great slurry of coal dust came down on the village of Aberfan, 9.15 in the morning. 116 children were killed, 28 adults, just a small community, hardly a household where there wasn't a bereavement. Whole generation children taken. Desolation. Said that for 12 months, didn't see anyone smile in Aberfan. Hope seems to have just gone. And it was Lloyd-Jones who was asked a year later to come and to mark the anniversary, the first anniversary. His text was, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. I don't know just how he handled that text, but we do know that God so spoke through the preaching that hearts that had been broken were mended and hope came back into the community and people smiled again. The word of God is alive, powerful and this is preaching. Well, let me just mention another occasion 
briefly um, one that appeals to me tremendously but I think perhaps it's be- well a friend of mine was involved 1948 a big meeting service was held in Westminster Chapel London it wasn't a church service Lloyd Jones wasn't there as a minister I think it was an Evangelical Alliance meeting but the speakers were a little bit mixed the first speaker everybody was so keen to hear was the Chancellor of the Exchequer of the day Sir Stafford Cripps another speaker or he was really more the chairman but I think he spoke a little was W.R. Matthews who was Dean of St. Paul's and then the closing speaker was Lloyd Jones well Cripps spoke first as I say and he spoke about the need for prayer and the benefit of prayer for the nation and the need for higher moral standards and how moral standards were good for a country and so on and he said things along those lines but then my friend who recorded in his diary what happened that night said that when Lloyd Jones got up he said that prayer is not some sort of device to get help from God for us God isn't here to serve nations that, that w- w- we don't use Christianity as a means of helping national life now I'm not giving you exactly his words but you see the point he was making God doesn't exist for us we live for God and from that point he went on to preach that what England needed was not a little more prayer or morals it needed regeneration it needed repentance and my friend who wrote this in his diary said he didn't look at Sir Stafford Cripps he was, he was demolishing really what the Chancellor of the Exchequer had said well preaching power of preaching our gospel came not to you Paul says in word only but in power in the Holy Ghost much assurance now what about his preaching since he died well you know that's a wonderful thing we've lived in an age when tapes have come into existence and, and we can hear the voices of men who are no longer here and thousands of Lloyd-Jones tapes go out every year a year or two ago I think 15,000 tapes in one year I was in California a few years ago and turning on the radio what did I hear on the radio but Lloyd-Jones preaching somebody had put cassette tape radio station radio was broadcasting so that preaching goes on and it goes on too in his books and these have been so wonderfully used Sermon on the Mount Romans Ephesians all sorts of people are touched people in prison people on a voyage at sea a holiday recreation go into a ship's library and pull off Lloyd Jones on the sh- from the shelf and something happens to them a student went from Korea to South Africa to do his doctorate and his subject was the preaching of Martin Lloyd-Jones another student met him from Brazil his name is Lopez, I've met him and Lopez says to this Korean student well, what are you studying? and the man says Lloyd-Jones well, I've never heard of Lloyd-Jones well so the Korean tells the Brazilian about Lloyd-Jones and this Brazilian his heart begins to burn and today he's preaching as Lloyd Jones preached in Brazil and it's a remarkable fact that you know some of you know that Lloyd Jones's books on Romans go to 14 volumes and those 14 volumes are all in print in Korean all 14 and they're all in print in 14 volumes in Brazil in Portuguese in other words these are books that speak to people's hearts they don't simply give information and direction but they lead people closer to God and to the word of God I've lost myself but I've recovered now another legacy getting near the end the fifth legacy He left us an understanding of the times in which we live in the United Kingdom. And I think this is a great thing. You know, we can 
look at details sometimes and we forget the broad picture. And Lord Jones looked at the broad picture. And he had a great opportunity to do so because uh, through a long life he travelled the length and breadth of England, Scotland, Wales, Ireland. I think he knew this country religiously as a degree to which probably nobody else did. He preached in little villages, preached in big towns. And as his life went on and drew to its conclusion, one thing was unmistakable. Decline in the church. Decline in numbers. Decline in faith. A situation that was a great burden to him. And then the question was, how is this situation to be faced, this decline in the Christian church? And some people said, the answer is evangelism. The church has got to reach out. The church has got to get to new people. Lloyd-Jones didn't agree with that. He agreed with evangelism, of course. But not as the first thing. The first thing he said was, the church... The church has to be revived. The church needs new discipline. The church needs to be brought back to repentance and to real faith in the word of God. That was his emphasis. It's a living church that becomes a real witness to a dying nation. And that takes us back to his point about the local church, but as well as the local church, he pleaded that all gospel-believing churches should stand together. He pleaded that we were in a situation of crisis and urgency and seriousness in which this was no time for Christians to be divided over secondary issues, matters of church government and things of that kind. If we believe the Bible is the word of God and want to be faithful to Christ, then let us stand together. He pleaded for that. That brought him into conflict with the ecumenical movement. The ecumenical movement said, the reason the world isn't listening to the church is because the church is so divided. And if churches will only come together, unite, then the world will be impressed. How they'll see our numbers, they'll see our strength. And so the ecumenical movement preached unity. And so did Lloyd-Jones. But it was a different kind of unity. The ecumenical movement didn't begin by defining what a Christian is. Lord Jones said, before you can talk about unity, you have to say what it means to be united to Christ. As we are united to Christ, then we are indeed united to all Christians. But the ecumenical movement wanted to bypass what is the gospel you have to believe. They didn't want to discuss that, they just wanted to talk about unity. And Lord Jones said that that kind of unity is a sham unity. It's not the real thing. But he was pleading for true unity amongst God-fearing, Bible-believing people. And he pleaded that a false unity led to the situation, the Apostle Paul speaks about it, where error eats like a cancer. It brings compromise. It weakens churches. Paralyzes the work of the church. So, his understanding of the times went in that way. And his fear was that if true Bible-believing Christians didn't act together, stand together, we should simply be overrun by a worldly church, by deviations from the faith. We, he, he died believing that a supreme need was that Christians who are Bible believers should stand together. A third, a third, sorry, a sixth and last legacy. And I think he would have put this first and he would have made it most important of all. It's the lesson that the growth of the church depends entirely upon the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit saith the Lord. Many people were suggesting all kinds of remedies for the church. Better scholarship, some said. Others said, 
try and get important people into the church and get them to give their testimonies all sorts of remedies and Lloyd-Jones went back to this one we need the Holy Spirit's grace large measure he believed as John Knox said the Reformation Knox said that God gave his Holy Spirit to simple men in great abundance that's what happened 16th century Lloyd-Jones believed it could happen today and he believed earnestly that the Holy Spirit doesn't need to be given to a multitude of people in greater power but a few a few earnestly seeking God can be anointed with fresh power and influence that oftentimes in history it's only been a remnant of men who have turned the tide and I remember how grieved he was after speaking at one minister's meeting I'm afraid here in Scotland when he said he sensed there was no real expectation of revival now you know back in before the disruption of 1843 Horatius Bonner says that people like William Chalmers Burns and John Milne of Perth eminent preachers Bonner says that they weren't like that until something was given to them 1838-39 something happened to them same thing happened to John MacDonald, the Apostle of the North, you remember, some of you remember, when he was at the Gallic Chapel in Edinburgh. Something happened to him that made him a new man, Dr. Kennedy of Dingwall says. He was a Christian before, but he had a new endowment of the Holy Spirit and his preaching became different. Now, Lord Jones believed that. And he believed it on the basis of Scripture. Acts chapter 4, when they had prayed place was shaken where they were assembled together they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spoke the word of God with boldness that something happened to the preaching now my friends that surely is of tremendous importance what makes an evangelist? an evangelist is a man with a heart full of love and compassion where does that come from? from the fullness of the Holy Spirit the mind of Christ the more we have the spirits enabling the more we shall be touched with the need of the generation around us and that leads by the grace of God to a new day and a better day so as I say uh, we are trying to obey the scripture remember them who have spoken unto you the word of God whose faith follow and then what follows? Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today and forever. We don't speak of Lloyd-Jones or anyone else to honour men, but to thank God that he gave such men and that he is able to do that today. And we all, I pray, we go home and we bow our knees to God to send us men endued with the Spirit and our pastors, our faithful pastors that thank God we do have that they will be given yet greater measures of the Spirit's grace and enabling and a final word don't let's forget what books can do when Lloyd-Jones was a 14 year old boy he was given a book which affected his whole later life and we have good books today grandparents can buy them for their grandchildren and get a good hardback book that will be in good shape in 50 years time there are a number of Lloyd Jones books there the book of his letters that numbers of people I think have not seen personal things come out in letters you know that, that you wouldn't get anywhere else if you're interested um, in Lloyd Jones as I trust you are take a look at his letters and then this is a book of his sermons on Isaiah chapter 40 a number of copies out there a great chapter comfort ye my people saith my God 40th chapter of Isaiah and then if I could just mention before I sit down this book has just been reprinted you know 450 years ago this month Latimer and Ridley were burned at the stake in Oxford and this is one of those books that tells the story of the Reformation in such a gripping and uplifting manner. It's Marcus Lone, 
masters of the English Reformation. Don't be put off by the English because remember Tyndale and these men, the New Testament came into Scotland just as well. But these are the books we need to be spreading and reading and if we're ministers we should be encouraging our people to read these books. And by the grace of God, books as well as prayer can lead us to a better day. So, thank you my friends. It's been good to speak on this subject.